In the previous video, uh, I was trying to show you the single strand of DNA uh, and the phosphodiester bonds uh, that join the individual nucleotides together. So, really quick, so uh, a short review here. We have a sugar molecule. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, and then a fifth carbon. So these are carbons that make up the sugar. Uh, we call them prime, one, two, three, four, and five prime. To the three prime carbon, we're going to have a hydroxyl group, an OH. And at the five prime carbon is going to be the phosphate. Okay, so the phosphate functional group. Remember, that's PO4, negative two. So what you're going to have uh, here is uh, this oxygen might have a double bond here. These two are going to carry a negative charge. So that's the phosphate functional group. We usually represent it with the, the P with the little circle around it. To the one prime is what we call the nitrogenous base. Okay. And that's what we have over here. So the nitrogenous bases we usually refer to uh, as A, T, G, and C. People just talk about those letters. They just say A, T, G, C. And to a lot, and most people don't know anything more than that. They just letters they're kind of it's kind of meaningless but people know there those letters are somehow related to discussions of dna and dna structure what we're specifically talking about are the nitrogenous bases now in a biochemistry course you would be drawing these structures in a general biology uh, intro cell biology course uh, typically you're not going to be drawing the structures uh, of the whole um, nitrogenous base but you should be familiar with it. You should be able to identify them and you should know a few things uh, about them. So first off, they're called nitrogenous bases. Okay. Uh, sometimes people just write N base, uh, but it's nitrogenous. So nitrogen, nitrogenous bases. So what do we mean by that? Well, in this case, a lot of times in the sugar, right? You have carbon, 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 carbon. They're carbons. Most of our biological molecules are carbons linked together. The fatty acids, right, we have carbon to carbon to carbon to carbon with hydrogens attached to them, and then maybe OH groups, you know, or, or carboxyl groups attached to them. Sugar is the same thing, carbon to carbon to carbon, OH groups and oxygens, you know, attached to them. Uh, amino acids, based off of carbons, and, but then we, ha and we have a carboxyl group, and then maybe an amino group, there's a nitrogen attached there. Now we have a structure here where there's alternating nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon. So there's nitrogens and carbons linked together. Now, instead of them just being in a linear chain, they're in these ring structures. So the nitrogenous bases have these rings. We have a purine ring. and pyrimidines. So these two are pyrimidines. The pyrimidines have a single ring. That's thymine and cytosine. The purines uh, are these two here, adenine and guanine. They have two rings. Now of the two names, one way that sometimes people um, try to remember that is the purine versus pyrimidine. Purine is a, a shorter term, uh, but yet it's the larger of the bases. And the pyrimidine is a longer word, uh, but the rings are smaller. There's only a single ring. So it's, it's kind of like the opposite. The big name goes with the little structure, and the little name goes with the bigger structure. Uh, it's one way people try to remember which is which. So T and C are pyrimidines and have a single ring. A and G are purines and have double rings. Again, you're not going to really be drawing these structures, but you should be able to kind of take a glance at them and at least know the difference between a, a purine and a pyrimidine, the two rings versus the, the one ring, and which names, which nucleotides. So the A and the G are purines. Okay. And you look at their structure uh, <clears throat> to see how they're similar. This ring here, pretty much identical. Okay. The second ring over here, nitrogen and nitrogen in these places, but now we have a couple differences. Here's an amino group, but over here, it's double bond to an oxygen. 
and then there's another amino group on the side. So guanine and adenine, again, are very similar in many ways, but you can see the difference uh, in a location of an amino group and an extra carbonyl group. <clears throat> Down here, cytosine and thymine, the pyrimidines. Look at their structure. Again, the ring is almost identical. Carbon, 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 nitrogen, same thing here. Nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen. There's a carbonyl, the double bond. A uh, little bit of difference. There's a double bond in the ring. This one is a double bond out of the ring. So this is an amino group up here. There's another carbonyl group. And this one has a methyl group, CH3. Okay. Um, in RNA, our ribonucleic acid, again, remember that in RNA, the sugar is different. But the main way the sugar is different is there's an OH here. That's pretty much it. That's ribose okay, versus deoxyribose. So we've got that. So let's tidy that up just so it's not all smeared here. Just put the hydrogen there. RNA also has this a nitrogenous base. Instead of T, it has U or we'll call uracil. So in RNA, has U instead of T. And the main difference here is the in the, the methyl group. So uracil is missing this methyl group. And that's pretty much it. It looks almost exactly the same. So it's very similar uh, to both thymine and cytosine. It's more similar to the, the thymine, uh, but it's, it's missing that, um, that methyl. And that's pretty much it. So um, just make sure you could recognize those. Now, what we're going to do is look at the, the structure. So we're going to put together um, the double strands is what we want to do. And to give you a real quick background you know, to this, um, a scientist named Chargoff. Was at one point investigating DNA structure before we knew a lot about the structure of DNA. And he was looking at the composition of DNA and the A's, T's, G's, and C's, like how many of them there are. And at the time, his hypothesis that he was testing, the question he was trying to answer uh, was that um, you know, not only what was the concentration, but he proposed that it would probably be the same. So that A would equal T, would equal G, would equal C, that they would all have the exact same concentration. So like 25%, 25%, 25, 25. And that would make up a DNA uh, molecule. So he then analyzed DNA and he found oh, that, wasn't, that wasn't true. They weren't exactly the same. But he started to find out a few things that were curious and he didn't, didn't quite understand. So the one thing that he found out was that the concentration of A and T was always the same. And the concentration of G and C was always the same. So A always equaled T and G always equaled C, but they did not necessarily, T did not equal G. It, it could, but it typically did not. Okay. So A and T, for some reason, were always the same. He also thought that in every living thing, plants and fish and humans and bacteria and everything, that the amounts would be the same. And he found uh, that was not true either. He found that there were differences. The, the amount of AT in a plant was different from one plant to another plant. That it was different from plants to animals. Different animals differed. So there was all these different amounts of them. Again, he didn't really know what it meant. But he reported it, and it was important and becomes important later on. That's how we sequence DNA. The sequences of the nucleotides are A's, T's, G's, and C's are what differ. The sugar, phosphate, that's pretty much the same. But this is our language written in just these four uh, nitrogenous bases that code for the information that gives rise to all the proteins that carried all the actions in our cells, which we'll kind of get to later as we go to gene expression. But for now, kind of just looking at structure. And structure is really important because if you don't understand structure, if you can't kind of create structure on a piece of paper or in your mind, you're not going to be really be able to understand process. So the processes of DNA replication, the process of transcription, the process of translation, these processes, which are, are, are fundamental to biology and cell biology and to this course in particular and other courses that you will take, you're not going to really get a handle on them unless you have a good grip on the structure. If you can draw the structure, if you can see the structure and focus on it, um, these things will make sense. So we're going to do this in a more simplistic way. Uh, and again, all we're, we're doing here is just the structure. So if we have, and I'm going to do it super simple, all right, sugar, 
that's a sugar. And sticking off the sugar is a phosphate functional group. And then sticking off that would be, let's say, a, an A, nitrogenous base. Okay. Now we're going to have a bond to another phosphate, another sugar, another phosphate, another sugar, another phosphate, another sugar, right? So this was this is our sugar phosphate backbone, which we mentioned. Okay. Now at the bottom, we have an OH. Remember, we, we gave these names. We said this end is the, the five prime end. This end is the three prime end. That's the number three carbon with the OH group this is the number five carbon with the phosphates. So now sticking off of these again, sugars are the nitrogenous bases. Here I put an A. Uh, let's here, well, let's put a G. Let's here put a C. Let's here put another A. Let's here put a T. These are just random. I'm just making them up just so we have all four and uh, a little bit of variation. Now, scientists didn't know if DNA was single-stranded, double-stranded, triple-stranded, you know, how, how, how the structures really came together. So again, more people were investigating the structure of DNA, back to a little bit of history. Uh, and then we get um, all these different hypotheses, people trying to test it out, not really knowing uh, what was what, but we get Rosalind Franklin. And there's a whole very interesting story of her work and her work in other people's labs and, and, and her own independent work. Basically, she's the scientist who looked at DNA and used a technique called X-ray diffraction to take sort of a, a photo of a DNA molecule. And the photo would reveal whether it was single or double or triple or, or, or how many strands of DNA there were. And, and this research demonstrated that there were two strands of DNA. So now at the same time that many people in the world are working on the structure of DNA, trying to figure it out all at the same time, everyone is coming up with little bits and pieces. So from years in the past, there's Chargoff and this information about the concentration of AT and G and C. Not knowing what it meant, but now it's starting to become a little more relevant. Rosalind Franklin says it's not single-stranded, it's double-stranded. Other people are working on the structure, and so we get uh, two people who may or may not you know, be familiar with. Um, James Watson and Francis Crick. So people often credit Watson and Crick with things that are, are not really true, like the discovery of DNA and that, that sort of thing. It, it, other people have been working on DNA, you know, even before before them. So people knew about DNA, um, didn't know exactly know the structure of it. So that's can, that was in sort of an ongoing process. But there were many people working on. They were not the the only ones. Well, Watson and Crick did why they again became a little more note noteworthy in, in texts and things over time, uh, as opposed to some of the other people, is they were the final people to put together all the pieces uh, of this sort of puzzle. And so they thought, okay, maybe with the two-stranded information that they got from Rosalind Franklin, so they got the information from her, they said, okay, maybe A, a bonds to A and G bonds to G and C to C, and but they tried to make a model of this and it didn't work. They couldn't, they couldn't put it together. It just didn't fit together. So then they went back to Chargoff and they said, well, this is interesting. They said, remember he said that A and T were always equal. So maybe that means that, you know, A's always bond to T's and the G's always bond to C's and that they were on the right track with that, but they couldn't quite make it work. Cause when they did their structures, I'll kind of draw the mirror, you know, image of it over here. Um, phosphate, you know, sugar, like this, they couldn't quite line up the bonds properly. So there was other information from other people on exactly the, the shape of the DNA molecule. Uh, that, again, this is again something that's a little more advanced, but when you look at the DNA as a double-stranded molecule, it has a certain shape to it, and it has these grooves to it like this. And these grooves are very regular and very well defined. Okay, this one's called a major groove, and this one's called a minor groove. And so people recognize that the the DNA molecule had a certain width to it. There's all these characteristics, and the, and Watson and Crick were building the model to match, and and they couldn't get it to match. Right, with the data that they had, and then one of them tried something a little bit different, and they went and took one of the strands of the DNA and they flipped it. Okay. 
like this. Again, I'm not drawing the full sugars or anything, but you're just kind of getting the idea. Okay, like this. So what do we have here? So we've got sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. But these things are um, they're reversed. Look, this is the three prime end up here. And this is the five prime end down here. So that means that when we bring over our nitrogenous bases, T would be upside down compared to the A. The C would be upside down compared to the G. This G is upside down. This T is upside down. This A is upside down and so forth. So <clears throat> when they did this, they found it matched. That the two strands came together the way that had been predicted. That the A's and T's formed two hydrogen bonds. And the G's and the C's formed three hydrogen bonds. One, two, three, one, two, one, two. And that this occurred the way that, that they thought it would. Uh, this was the overall structure of DNA. The double-stranded DNA had two strands that ran, what we called anti-parallel. The anti-parallel strands mean that one strand, if you look at it from top to bottom in this particular orientation, you have a five prime phosphate here, and it goes down to the three prime OH. The pair, the other strand that it's paired with is flipped. It's parallel to it, but it's anti or opposite in orientation. So this has the three prime OH end and the phosphate down at the bottom. So they're, they're upside down. And that's the way in which they fit together. That becomes very important later on as we discuss DNA replication, how DNA is copied. Watson and Crick took that information of structure and they immediately created another idea of theirs. Um, and so this was something new. It was an explanation of how DNA would be copied and replicated. Not every single detail, but the big picture. And what they said is that, oh, well, the way these strands pair up with A and T and G and C, if you split them in part and keep them separate, each one then contains the code that follows certain rules, which we call base pair rules, that A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. That's how we could know that no matter which strand we have, if we have this strand over here, if this was our template, let's say for example, and we wanted to know what is the sequence of the other strand in terms of the A, T, G, C sequence, we know it. So obviously, if this is a T, this one has to be an A. If that's a C, this one has to be a G. A G, this one has to be a C, A, T. We can do that. So if DNA was split apart, each part would be a template to build a whole brand new strand so that we get two new double-stranded DNAs. That's another topic, DNA replication, which we'll get into later. But to get into that topic and to cover some of the, the really specific details of it, you really need to get this basic structure. All right, so little details like two bonds between A and T, three between G and C, that's important. Um, just the fact that A and T only bond together, A does not bind with C, A does not bind with G, and so forth. Um, make sure you know that. Make sure you know the strands are anti-parallel and be able just to recognize the nitrogenous bases. Again, you don't have to redraw these from scratch, but if you see pictures of them without the names, you should be able to then uh, identify them or know, know that it's adenine, know that that's a purine ring, know that this is thymine, know that that's a, a pyrimidine ring. Now, if you could do that, you'll be in pretty good shape for the future.